Hello, hello. Is this fine now? But then I have to come too close. I don't think that this is going to come. This has to work. He speaks a lot of Okay. It's working now. And God willing, it will work continuously till Professor Bose finishes. It's important for us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this fifth Savarmati Memorial Lecture, which we have started as a tradition to invite the city people who live in Ahmedabad, who think, who would like to think and who would like to hear people, those who think. And in this series we have Professor Subhata Bose. He actually needs no introduction. Also because these days if you just Google and you will know so much more about what I am going to say which I am not going to say because it's, you can actually read everything. But what is most important for us to understand is he is a very distinguished professor who also has sat in the parliament not from the Rajya Sabha route but from the Lok Sabha route. So he is people's representative which is very distinguishing in this country. So in that sense we accord a very special welcome and if this is the kind of dynastic continuity we would like to have more. And in that continuation of what we had in past, his link with Netaji Subhashan Bose as family, his elder, and then his own quest and pursuit, which is very important for us, not only only for the academic sake, but for the sake of the vision which Netaji had, the way the country has unfolded after Gandhiji and after Netaji and he is a historian who studies the past and takes part in the action in the present. So I think this is a very distinguishing feature of yours and that actually is very special for us and we will welcome you on behalf of the Sabarmati Ashram. He is a very distinguished chair professor in Harvard where the post was lying back in because they couldn't find a person and they had decided that that person has to be from South Asia. And they found it after a gap of 10 years or so that we got Professor Sugata Bose on that chair. That's a very, very distinct uh, contribution and achievement of Professor Bose. As a professor does, he has written extensively with great intensity and obviously he has been sort of his reviews uh, are well they are on both the sides when there is you write in academics you are you are critiqued you are appreciated and the debate goes on and that's what the good writing means and his two books that he's going to give us there are very prominent books of his are his majesty's opponent by him which is subhash chandra bose in india's struggle against empire that's the book he has gifted to Ashram and thank you very much sir publicly and the nation as mother and other visions of nationhood which is again important in the context that Rashtriyata has found a new expression these days and we should really understand what was the Rashtriyata which Netaji had in mind and what was the Rashtriyata which Gandhiji had in mind and how, the, how both interacted, lived together, respected each other and that is how its special relationship which is also the topic today on which he is going to talk, understanding the special relationship Mahatma and Netaji. 
I think this is sufficed. I shouldn't be wasting more time. And Professor Post, you are most welcome to give the address. Thank you for accepting. Thank you very much for that uh, generous uh, introduction. I deem it a great honor to be invited to speak at uh, Sabarmati Ashram uh, on the eve of uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, 150th uh, birth anniversary. I have been here as an ordinary visitor to see the museum, but this is my first opportunity to address a distinguished gathering in these uh, hallowed premises. So thank you very much to all of those at Sabarmati Ashram who have welcomed me here. The arrival in February 1938 of a revolutionary leader from Bengal to preside over the 51st session of the Indian National Congress in Gujarat, the home province of the Apostle of Nonviolence, carried powerful symbolic meaning. It represented the meeting of two generations and the merging of two strands of the anti-colonial movement that had been often at odds with each other. The spectacle of Shubhashchandra Bose being taken in a chariot pulled by 51 white bulls to the Congress venue in the rural setting of Haripura connected agrarian and urban India and evoked an idyllic past beckoning a dynamic future. Mahatma Gandhi and Shubhashchandra Bose in earnest conversation on the dais at the plenary session of the Congress warmed the hearts of millions of Indians looking forward to a united nationalist stand against the Raj. The saint's holiness had to be complemented by the warrior sword as Aurobindo Ghosh had argued three decades ago in the pursuit of justice and righteousness. India's two men of destiny had first met nearly 17 years ago. After resigning from the Indian civil service, Shubhash had set sail for India with an unwavering sense of mission to serve his country's cause. He landed in Bombay on July 16, 1921 and rushed to see Gandhiji the same afternoon. At Mani Bhavan, his usual place of stay in Bombay, the Mahatma sat in the middle of a large room decorated with Indian carpets. He was surrounded by some of his closest followers who all wore Indian garments made of khadi. Feeling somewhat out of place, Shubhash opened the conversation by apologizing for his European attire. He was soon put at ease by the Mahatma's characteristic hearty smile and warm indulgence. The eager and impatient young recruit bombarded the leader more than double his age with a series of insistent questions. How would the movement of non-violent non-cooperation that Gandhiji had been spearheading since 1920 accelerate in stages towards its climax? in the form of non-payment of taxes to the government. How could that and civil disobedience compel the foreign rulers to concede Indian freedom? How would Gandhiji fulfill his promise to the people of delivering Swaraj within one year? Seven years later, at the open session of the Calcutta Congress, Shubhash sponsored an amendment demanding complete independence or Purna Swaraj instead of dominion status in opposition to Mahatma Gandhi. He simply did not believe that there was any reasonable chance of the British granting dominion status within 12 months 
as was demanded in the main resolution. Gandhiji promised that if the year 1929 did not bring Dominion home rule, he would himself become an independence wala, and he of course kept his promise. Subhash played a very important role in Gandhiji's civil disobedience movement of 1930-31. Upon his release from prison in March 1931, he rushed to Bombay to meet Gandhiji and was satisfied that the leader had not diluted his stand on independence. Subhash continues his talks as he travelled by train with the Mahatma from Mumbai to Delhi and saw for himself from the ovation at wayside stations that Gandhiji was at the zenith of his popularity. Once sent into forced European exile in 1933, Subhash was fortunate to find a kindred spirit from Gujarat convalescing, convalescing like him in a Viennese sanatorium. This was Vithal Bhai Patel, a leader of the Swaraj party. This was Vithal Bhai Patel, as you see in this uh, photograph, a leader of the Swaraj party, founded by Bose's late mentor, Siyan Das and Motilal Nehru. Vithal Bhai younger, Vithal Bhai's younger brother, Vallabh Bhai Patel, was a loyal lieutenant of Gandhiji in Gujarat, but it was the rebellious spirit of the young man from Bengal that captured Vithal Bhai's imagination. Subhash became Vithal Bhai's successor as India's ambassador abroad in Europe between 1933 and 1936. Subhash received an invitation to preside over the third Indian political conference in London on June 10, 1933. Denied permission to visit the imperial metropolis, the presidential address on the anti-imperialist struggle and Samyavada to the London gathering had to be read in absentia. It contained both an appreciation and a critique of Gandhi and Satyagraha between 1920 and 1933. Shubhash accepted that Gandhiji had opted for the correct method of struggle in 1920 and roused the entire country. He went on to enunciate his own ideal of Samyavad, attracted by European political experiments in socialism, he nevertheless preferred to use the old Buddhist Indian term to articulate his ideology of socialism suited to Indian conditions, one that invoked equality in an atmosphere of balance and harmony. I shall probably be elected the president of the Indian National Congress early next year, Shubhash wrote in a private letter on September 9, 1937. The elections by the party branches take place in early January 1938. Gandhiji had clearly broached the subject with him by this time. A Gandhian connection to Shubhash during the summer of 1937 was provided by Mira Ben or Madeline Slade the Mahatma's English disciple, who spent two months in Dalhousie as a guest of the Dharmavirs at the same time as Shubhash. In this photograph, in this photograph, you see uh, Shubhash arriving in Lahore in Punjab, uh, being greeted by the Dharmavis, and then they went to Dalhousie. In late October 1937, the Bose brothers, Sharat and Shubhash, 
were the sinusure of the anti-colonial movement as the top leadership of the Indian National Congress gathered in Calcutta. These are the Bose brothers, Sharath and Shubhash, in the Elgin Road house, and round the corner, Gandhiji stayed at Sharath's house, one Woodburn Park. The entire top floor of Sharath Bose's home was given over to Mahatma Gandhi and his entourage. The large terrace was used for Gandhiji's prayer meetings. The music was not restricted in Calcutta to his favorite hymns, but had a more eclectic range with the presence of Dilip Kumar Roy and the young sensation Uma Basu, whom Gandhi described as the Nightingale of India. Dilip had often sung devotional and patriotic songs before in this house, and the Bose brothers had listened with tears flowing down their cheeks. For Gandhi, one evening, he sang Abide With Me and other English prayer music. The Mahatma was deeply moved. With Gandhi, Nehru, and Bose present in the house, the residential mansion was transformed during the Congress meeting into a public place, with throngs gathered outside and forcing their way inside, seeking to catch a glimpse of their beloved leaders. <coughs> the question of Bengali political detainees was an explosive political matter that had to be addressed by the Congress leadership. All the civil disobedience prisoners had been released by then, but many revolutionaries were still in jail. Gandhiji's exertions made him very ill with high blood pressure on November 1st, and his doctors had to struggle to stabilize his condition. A concerned Rabindranath Tagore came to visit. He was quite frail himself and had to be carried upstairs in a chair by Sharuk, Subhash, Jawaharlal, and Mahadev Desar to see the Mahatma. It was utterly impossible for me to think of myself in Calcutta when Gandhiji was there, Subhash Chandra Bose wrote, especially after his own collapse on the 1st of November because we had invited him to tackle the case of about 2,000 imprisoned detainees and political prisoners. By this time, Gandhiji had decided that there really was no one other than Shubhash who deserved to become the next president of the Indian National Congress. Gandhiji encouraged the stormy petrol of Indian politics to take a break in Europe before taking up his onerous responsibility in January of 1938. This picture is in Bad in in Austria, and the next one was taken in Czechoslovakia in January of 1938, and I chose to use this portrait as the cover of the Indian edition of my book, His Majesty's Opponent. After crossing the breadth of the subcontinent from east to west, from February 11th to 13th, 1938, Shubhash Chandra Bose alighted from the train at Bardoli, which had been a storm center of the peasant movement in Gujarat. From there, he traveled by car to Haripura, before being carried in a ceremonial chariot to the temporary city that had been constructed to host the Congress session. The city, designed to accommodate 50,000 residents, and 200,000 daily visitors had been named Vital Nagar. The public and private spaces of the Congress venue were embellished with a couple of hundred painted posters depicting Indian rural life, as many as 86 by the great painter Nandalal Bose. This was a creative display of the popular culture of mass nationalism. Following the pop style, Nandalal remembered, we did a large number of paintings and hung them everywhere, on the main entrance, inside the volunteers' camps, even in the rooms meant for Bapuji and Shubhash Babu, the president. On reaching Vital Nagar, Shubhash Chandra Bose hoisted the Indian tricolor flag and proclaimed, 
There is no foreigner that can keep India in state anymore. India has been free. Shubhash's performance at Haripura, especially his lengthy and weighty presidential address, was a crime. It was as much a lecture on the present as on the future. He put forward his vision of the social and economic reconstruction of India after freedom was won. Clad in the traditional spotless white Bengali dhoti and Punjabi made of khadi and a white Kashmiri shawl with a delicate embroidered border twirled around him, he exuded confidence and impressed everyone with his quiet authority. On formal occasions, he donned the white Gandhi cap. At Badgastai, he had told A.K. Chetiar, who made the first film on Gandhi, that he did not smile on demand when asked to pose for the camera. At Haripura, he smiled spontaneously. When he asked the poor and obscure to come forward with their poverty and obscurity for the service of the motherland, they heard a voice of sincerity and were ready to respond. As Congress President, Shubhash tried hard to work in cooperation with Gandhi and sought to carry the Congress Working Committee with him on important matters. Congress participation in coalition governments in the Muslim majority provinces, in his opinion, would strengthen the party in speaking with the British. He spelled out to Gandhiji what he saw as the need of the hour in clear terms. While endeavouring to bring about a coalition ministry in the remaining three provinces, there were already Congress ministries in eight out of the 11 provinces, we should lose no time in announcing our decision on the various Hindu-Muslim problems that would have come up for discussion if negotiations had taken place between the Congress and the Muslim League. Simultaneously, we should hold an inquiry into the grievances of the Muslims against the Congress governments. These two steps will help to satisfy reasonable Muslims that we are anxious to understand their complaints and to remedy them as far as humanly possible. A proposal to conduct an inquiry into the conduct of Congress ministries in the Hindu majority provinces was a red rag to the right wing of the party, comfortably enjoying the fruits of office. Shubhash Bose's approach in addressing the intertwined challenges to the construction of an all India nationalism presented by affiliations of religious community and linguistic region was significantly different and substantially more generous than that of most others among the then Congress leadership. Ever since he spoke at the Maharashtra Provincial Conference in 1928, he was calling for an independent federal republic in India with a large measure of autonomy for the regional peoples. He was also wanting to build unity among religious communities in a way that was not so different from the approach of Mahatma Gandhi. Now, of course, we know there was a parting of the ways. In 1939, there were several reasons for it. There were differences over the federal part of the Government of India Act, the role of the princely states. There were some differences of opinion on socialist planning through the National Planning Committee that Shubhashan Rapos set up, even though he was generous enough to include J.C. Kumarappa, who was a Gandhian purist, on his National Planning Committee. But most importantly, there were disagreements about what to do in Bengal. And Shubhashan Rapos was very anxious that there should be both Hindu and Muslim participation in any government that ran Bengal, but that was not possible at that time. So there was a contested election, and the democratic verdict of the delegates from the provinces after an unprecedented electoral contest was delivered on January 29, 1939. The final tally showed that Shubhash Chandra Bose had emerged victorious by 1,580 votes to Gandhiji's choice, Bhaktar Bhisitharamaya's 1,375. 
Bengal had voted decisively for both, while Gujarat and Andhra had gone Sitaramaya's way. Among the major provinces, Shubhash Bose carried the United Provinces, Punjab and Assam in the north, and Karnataka, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu in the south. The regional spread of his support was impressive. For the first time in two decades, Gandhiji's authority had been challenged within the Indian National Congress. It will always be my aim and object, Shubhash promised, to try and win his confidence for the simple reason that it will be a tragic thing for me if I succeed in winning the confidence of other people but fail to win the confidence of India's greatest man. The right wing of the Congress struck a calculated political blow at Tripuri, where Gandhiji was not present, in their campaign to avenge the defeat in the presidential election. They brought a resolution moved by Govind Ballabh Pant, the Congress Premier of the United Provinces, that the Congress Executive should command Gandhiji's implicit confidence and requests the President to nominate the Working Committee in accordance with the wishes of Gandhiji. Now, Shubhash Chandra Bose tried very hard to get Gandhiji to nominate members of the Working Committee, but was unsuccessful. Once it was clear that an impasse had been reached, Shubhash submitted his resignation as Congress President in an entirely helpful spirit at the meeting of the All India Congress Committee in Calcutta on April 29, 1939. His conduct won the approbation of no less a figure than Rabindranath Tagore, who sent a message. The dignity and forbearance which you have shown in the midst of a most aggravating situation has won my admiration and confidence in your leadership. The same perfect decorum has still to be maintained by Bengal for the sake of her own self-respect and thereby to help turn your apparent defeat into a permanent victory. During the war crisis that erupted in September 1939, the rest of the Congress leadership behaved like His Majesty's opposition. Having shed all inhibitions of colonial subjecthood, Shubhash Chandra Bose alone stood forth as His Majesty's opponent. However, I think it's very important to recognize that many people in India, particularly in Bengal, I might add, hugely exaggerate the differences that took place in 1939. If there was a parting of the ways, it was a temporary one. And if we study the relationship between Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shuhash Chandra Bose in its entirety, then we will find that it was one that was marked by deep mutual love, affection, and respect. While Trubhash was kept under close police watch in his home at 38 by 2 Elgin Road following his hunger strike in jail, not even the letters he exchanged with Mahatma Gandhi could evade the prying eyes of the colonial state. On December 23, 1940, Shubhash wrote to Gandhiji offering his unconditional support to any new movement the Mahatma might lead in the cause of India's independence. You are irrepressible, whether ill or well, Balu Bapu wrote to his rebellious son on December 29, 1940. Do get well before going in for fireworks. On January 3rd, 1941, the government censors opened and read this letter from Gandhiji to Shubhash. Little did they know that the rebel had already completed preparations for his fireworks and was simply waiting for the right moment to light the fuse. On the night of January 16, 17, 1941, Shubhash escaped from Calcutta, driven in a German-made wanderer car by his young nephew, Shishi. By 1942, Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose had a shared perspective on the war. 
even though Subhash had failed to persuade Gandhiji to issue an ultimatum to the British in 1939, the British debacle at the hands of the Japanese in Southeast Asia emboldened the Mahatma to prepare for a final showdown with the British Raj. He was confident of his ability to negotiate with the Japanese, who would have no reason to enter India if it was rid of the British presence. In the spring of 1942, the apostle of non-violence was even prepared to take the risk of violence to end what he called the great calamity of slavery. Molana Azad found that Subhash Bose's escape to Germany had made a great impression on Gandhiji. He had not formally approved many of Bose's actions, Azad explained, but now I found a change in his outlook. Many of his remarks convinced me that he admired the courage and resourcefulness Subhash Bose had displayed in making his escape from India. His admiration for Subhash Bose unconsciously colored his view about the whole war situation. With World War II raging across Europe and Asia, an American journalist, Louis Fisher, had come to see Mahatma Gandhi in early June 1942. The young American was puzzled by the Indian reluctance to line up unambiguously on the side of the Allies against the Axis powers. There were powerful elements of fascism in British rule, Gandhi told his interlocutor, and these were the elements Indians encountered on a daily basis. Your president, Gandhi continued, talks about the four freedoms. Do they include the freedom to be free? We are asked to fight for democracy in Germany, Italy, and Japan. How can we when we haven't got it ourselves? Louis Fischer asked Gandhi about both in the course of their conversations. In his response, Gandhi described Chuhashandra Bose as, quote, a patriot of patriots, unquote, albeit misguided. What Fisher learned about Bose from Pushet Ben, granddaughter of Dadabhai Nauroji, who was deputed by Gandhi to take care of his guest, was even more revealing. If Bose entered India at the head of an Indian army, Pushet Ben told Louis Fisher, he could rally the whole country. Bose, according to this feisty 40-year-old woman, was, quote, more popular than Nehru. And in certain circumstances, in certain circumstances, had a stronger appeal than Gandhi. The historical significance of Netaji's submarine voyage from Europe to Asia that began on February 9, 1943, is underscored by the British response to another crucial development in India on the same day. This was the commencement of Mahatma Gandhi's fast that was to keep Indians on tentacles for three weeks. The British cabinet had decided that if Gandhiji fasted, he would be allowed to die. Flushed with the victories at El Alamein and Stalingrad, Churchill was of the clear opinion that, quote, this our hour of triumph everywhere in the world was not the time to crawl before a miserable old man who had always been our enemy, unquote. In the event of Gandhi's death, Linlitko expected six months unpleasantness, unpleasantness steadily declining in volume, little or nothing at the end of it. Linlitko thanked Churchill for refusing to yield to, quote, the world's most successful humbug who was engaged in a wicked system of blackmail and terror, unquote. At a time when the Quit India movement was nearly crushed and the Mahatma was being treated with scant respect, Netaji was showing grit and determination to fight the colonial masters. Here he is in a rubber boat transferring from a German to a Japanese submarine. Netaji's Azadin Forge in Southeast Asia, or its first division, was organized into three regiments or brigades, named after Gandhi, Nehru, and Azad, in a conscious effort to make common cause with the struggle at home. Jai Hind was chosen from the very outset as the common greeting or salutation when Indians met one another. A simple Hindustani translation of Tagore's song, Janagano Mano Hinaya Jai became the national anthem. 
just as the three battalions of INA's Gandhi Brigade, commanded by Inayat Kiani, started arriving in Burma from Malaya, Netaji received news that Kasturba, the Mahatma's wife, had died in Pune while in British custody. In a broadcast from Rangoon, Prabhash paid a moving tribute to the quote, great lady who was a mother to the Indian people. Once the Mahatma was released from prison in India, Netaji made a lengthy radio broadcast to him on July 6, 1944. Netaji offered the most detailed justification of his course of action during the Second World War. He lauded the Mahatma once more for bravely sponsoring the Quit India Resolution. The mission of the provisional government he had set up would be over once India became free. The Indian people will then choose their form of government and decide who should be in charge of that government. He and his co-workers regarded themselves as servants of the Indian people. Freedom of their motherland was the only reward they sought in return for their suffering and sacrifice. S.A. Ayer observed Netaji intently in the studio as he prepared to deliver the last line of his address. Father of our nation, he began. His voice turned hoarse, then quivered, and a solemn look came over his face. His throat cleared, and the words came out clear and strong. In this holy war for India's liberation, and then a pause, a lowering of the pitch, and in a tone of supplication, we ask for your blessings and good wishes. In December 1945, the Mahatma paid homage to his rebellious son Shubhash in the bedroom of the Elgin Road home from where he had made his great escape in 1941. He had first gone to Shantiniketan where he said that we ought not to be making statues to great men. We have to follow their ideas. He also paid homage to Netaji in that, this bedroom. Gandhiji was in Medinipur on January 3rd, 1946, when news came that the Red Fort Three, Saigal, Hillen and Shanawas, who had been sentenced to deportation for life on December 31st, 1945, had been released. On February 10th, 1946, he decided to revive his journal Harijan after a gap of three and a half years. One of his first articles published on February 12th addressed the question of unity. Netaji's name, Gandhiji wrote, is one to conjure with. His patriotism is second to none. His bravery shines through all his actions. He aimed high but failed, but who has not failed? Ours is to aim high and to aim well. The lesson that Netaji and his army brings to us is one of self-sacrifice, unity, irrespective of class and community, and discipline. Netaji Gandhiji told military men who came to visit him in Guruli Kanchan in March 1946 had rendered a signal service to India by giving the Indian soldier a new vision and a new idea. In Young India, Gandhiji had written after Jalian Balabal how the Indian soldier had been used by the British as a hired assassin. For 20 years, Shubhash Chandra Bose worked under Gandhiji's leadership in the non-violent movement, and he saw how the civilian Indian masses had rallied to Mahatma Gandhi, but Indian soldiers were still loyal to the King Emperor. And that is what he wanted to change by going abroad in 1941. The Mahatma initially harbored a hope that Netaji would return to join him in the war for unity. But on March 30th, 1946, Gandhiji explained in the Harijan his earlier feeling that Netaji could not leave us until his dreams of Swaraj had been fulfilled. To link strength to this feeling, he added, was the knowledge of Netaji's great ability to hoodwink his enemies and even the world for the sake of his cherished goal. 
this instinct had suggested to him Netaji was alive. He now could no longer rely on, quote, such unsupported feeling, unquote, as there was, quote, strong evidence to counteract the feeling, unquote. In the face of these proofs, the Mahatma wrote, I appeal to everyone to forget what I have said and believing in the evidence before them to reconcile themselves to the fact that Netaji has left us. All man's ingenuity is as nothing before the might of the one God. He alone is truth and nothing else stands. The ideal of unity that Netaji had instilled in his followers remained alive. On his return to Delhi in early April 1946, Gandhiji visited INA prisoners in the Kabul lines and the Red Fort. He was told that they had never felt any distinction of, of creed or religion in the INA. But here we are faced with Hindu tea and Muslim tea, they complained. Why do you suffer it? Gandhiji asked. No, we don't, they said. We mix Hindu tea and Muslim tea exactly half and half and then serve. The same with food. That's very good, exclaimed Gandhiji, laughing. On his arrival in East Bengal in November 1946, Gandhiji fondly remembered his first visit to the region in the company of the Ali brothers, Muhammad and Shaukat Ali, during the non-cooperation movement. I claim to be an Indian, he asserted, and therefore a Bengali, even as I am a Gujarati. Bengal had produced not just Tagore and Bumpi, but also, as he put it, the heroes of the Chittagong Armory Raid, however misguided their action might have been in my eyes. He could not understand how could there could be cowardice in a province with that lineage. Bengal might still solve the problem facing all of India. Based in remote Noakhali, Gandhiji consistently argued in favor of provincial rights. He admitted that Shubhash Bose had been right in contending in 1939 that Assam was a special case and that the Gopinath Bordaloi ministry should not resign along with the other provincial governments. We look to the Congress, Gandhi pointed out, and then we feel that if we do not follow it slavishly, something will go wrong with it. I have said, that not only a province, but even an individual can rebel against the Congress and by doing so, save it. The Mahatma had come a long way from imposing the discipline of the High Command on provincial units. Between January 7 and March 2, 1947, Mahatma Gandhi undertook a 116-mile pilgrimage on foot through 47 villages of Noakhali and Tipeda. The cause of communal riots, he bluntly said, was the idiocy of both the communities. At Dalta on January 23rd, the Chaudhuris of the village gifted him the plot of land on which his prayer meeting was held. He was glad that on the auspicious birthday of Netaji Shuhash Chandra Bose, he had received this gift and had the privilege of staying at the home of a scheduled caste friend, Rai Mohan Mali. He reminded his audience that Netaji was an Indian first and last and that he fired all under him with the same zeal so that they forgot in his presence all distinctions and acted as one man. Shubhash had in his life verified the saying of Tulsidas that all becomes right for the brain. Between May 9th and May 14th, 1947, in Shodhpur, Gandhiji explored the possibility of keeping Bengal united in a series of interviews with Sharat Chandra Bose, Abul Hashim, and Hussein Shahid Sarabhati. Gandhiji told Hashim on May 10th that he had been trying to become a Bengali. His main reason for learning Bengali was to be able to read Tagore's poems in the original. When Hashim professed that Hindus and Muslims alike revered the poet, Gandhiji responded that the spirit of the Upanishads bound Tagore to the whole of Indian culture. What would Hashim have to say, he asked, if Bengal wished 
to enter into a voluntary association with the rest of India. On May 12th, Gandhiji gave Suravarti an undertaking in writing that so long as the Muslim League leader showed sincerity and undertook to preserve Bengal for the Bengalis, Hindus and Muslims, the Mahatma was prepared to act as his honorary private secretary. Having heard that the plan for a united sovereign Bengal had received Gandhiji's blessings, Shama Prashad Mukherjee rushed to Shodhpur on May 13th. Gandhiji wanted Mukherjee to evaluate the scheme on its merits. An admission that Bengali Hindus and Bengali Muslims were one, Gandhiji told the Mahasabha leader, would really be a severe blow against the two-nation theory of the league. Gandhiji was said to have lamented in 1947 that all his yes-men, including Vallabhai Patel and Jawaharlal Nehru, had turned into his no-men. As the partitioner's axe was about to fall, the Mahatma may have missed the rebellious son whom he had cast aside in 1939 in favor of the more obedient ones. Gandhiji stood as a tragic, lonely figure during the communal holocaust that accompanied partition. The saint and the warrior acting in concert may have had a better chance of averting the catastrophe that engulfed the subcontinent in 1947, but that was not to be. Once August 15, 1947 was set as the date for independence, Gandhiji expressed his desire to spend that day in Noakhali. He did, however, take a detour to Kashmir and Punjab in early August. At Srinagar, he made clear his view that the future of Kashmir, quote, should be decided by the will of the Kashmiris, unquote. On August 6th in Lahore, he told the Congress workers there that he was going to spend the rest of his life in East Bengal or West Punjab or maybe the Northwest Frontier province. Once he reached Bengal, he abandoned his plan of going to Noakhali on August 11th to work for the return of sanity to Calcutta, this premier city of India. On August 13th, he moved into a Muslim home in the Belayakhata neighborhood of Calcutta. Ignoring the celebrations in New Delhi, Gandhiji chose to spend Independence Day fasting and praying with those who were poor and obscure. The Information and Broadcasting Department of the Government of India asked him for a message. The father of our nation simply said that he had run dry. Peace and camaraderie reigned in Calcutta on August 15, 1947. In an editorial titled Miracle or Accident, on August 16, Gandhi narrated how Hindus were taken to masjids and Muslims to mandirs at the dawn of freedom and both the communities chanted Jai Hind in unison. It was neither miracle nor accident, but the willingness of human beings to dance to God's tune. We have drunk the poison of mutual hatred, Gandhiji wrote, and so this nectar of fraternization tastes all the sweeter, and the sweetness should never wear out. Gandhiji fasted again, when there was further trouble in Calcutta, and then after restoring peace there, he left on the 7th of September for Delhi, after leaving a message for Bengalis, Amar Jigoni Amar Bani, my life is my message. And the people of Calcutta and Bengal are eternally grateful that it was only because of Mahatma Gandhi's presence that peace prevailed in this, or in what was then the premier city of India. You all know about Mahatma Gandhi's final fast between January 12th and January 18th of 1948. A fast undertaken to defend a vulnerable minorities. The final week of the Mahatma's life Oh, this was Gandhi in Shodhpur, which I mentioned with Sharad Bose, the beautiful photograph. 
The final week of the Mahatma's life was rich with symbolism, redolent of India's unity. On January 23, 1948, Gandhiji was very glad to take note of Shubhash's birthday, even though he generally did not remember such dates. And, quote, the deceased patriot believed in violence, unquote, while he was wedded to non-violence. Shubhash, according to the Mahatma, knew no provincialism nor communal differences and had in his brave army men and women drawn from all over India without distinction and evoked affection and loyalty which very few have been able to evoke. A lawyer friend had requested Gandhiji for a good definition of Hinduism. He did not offer any but suggested that Hinduism regarded all religions as worthy of all respect. Shubhash Bose, according to him, was such a Hindu, and so, in memory of that great patriot, he called upon his countrymen to cleanse their hearts of all communal bitterness. January 26th was Independence Day for Gandhiji's generation. Let us permit ourselves to hope, he said on that occasion, that though geographically and politically India is divided into two, at heart we shall ever be friends and brothers, helping and respecting one another and be one for the outside world. On the morning of January 30th, 1948, Gandhiji did not neglect to do his daily Bengali writing exercise, even though he had other pressing work, such as drafting a new constitution for the Congress. The sound the sound of the shots fired at the Mahatma that evening echoed across the length and breadth of this great land. The last few months of Gandhiji's life and the manner of his death, in the historian B. R. Nanda's work, constituted an epic struggle between an all-embracing humanism and sectarian fanaticism. A 17-year-old girl was attending an interregional and intercaste wedding of a Bengali bride and a Malayali groom in Calcutta that evening when she heard the stunning news that Gandhiji had been shot dead. She tried to persuade herself that it must be a rumor. A pall of gloom slowly descended on the gathering and the guests quietly departed. Returning home, this is my mother writing in her rem reminiscences, now 88. Returning home, she heard the radio playing the song Shomukhe Shanti Paraba as the great soul began his journey across the ocean of peace. Sharat Chandra Bose, my grandfather, loved English literature and Shakespeare as much as he had hated British rule. On receiving the heartrending news that the Mahatma was no more, he remarked wistfully, when comes such another? He could have added, if ever another. Jai Hind. That was simply beautiful touching and brilliant. I would check with Professor Bose whether he would like to take a few questions. Thank you. So questions are invited from the audience. The mic will come to you.
The Ataji, of course, had given the call to Chalo Delhi, but the march to Delhi was halted at Imphal and Kohima, and he made a retreat, uh, a glorious retreat, actually, with his soldiers and women of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment uh, in uh, April and May of 1945. He walked on foot. There was a 23-day trek from Burma back to Thailand and then to Malaya and Singapore. And then, of course, in August came the news of the atom bombs and the Second World War came to a uh, southern end. Uh, and uh, Netaji was uh, in Singapore uh, on 15th uh, of August of uh, 1945. His own instinct was to stay in Singapore with his soldiers and followers, but his cabinet advised him to move out of uh, Singapore. And uh, so a decision was taken that uh, he would try to go either to Soviet-held Manchuria if possible or to Japan. The Soviet held Manchuria because he expected that there would be a falling out between the Soviet Union on the one hand and the United States and the United Kingdom on the other. And Japan because the idea was that in Singapore uh, the British would come and take charge while if he was to be taken prisoner it may be better to be in the hands of the Americans rather than the British. So it was in some ways an adventure into the unknown. He flew from from Singapore to Bangkok. He spent a whole day there with many of his followers. In fact, there was a pretty good plan for him to stay in Bangkok or in, um, you know, and be underground for a while. Um, but he took the riskiest route possible. He then flew from Bangkok uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Saigon. And uh, there, of course, uh, the situation was very different. In Singapore and um, uh, Bangkok, he was surrounded by his supporters and friends. That's where he had built up the Azad in movement. And he was moving in a Japanese bomber. And um, from uh, Saigon, he flew to Turin, today's Da Nang, and then to Taipei. And that Japanese military bomber, uh, where he had only one Indian companion, uh, you know, Habibu Rahman uh, crashed on takeoff in Taipei on August 18, 1945. Uh, as a historian, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, Netaji was the only front rank leader of the Indian independence movement who laid down his life fighting for freedom on the battlefield. He was trying to move from one battlefield to another. And I actually entirely agree with Gandhiji when he wrote that on the one hand there was unsupported feeling and on the other hand there was strong evidence. Nothing could have been better if Netaji had been able to return. And just imagine, this happened in August of 1945 and when in November 1945 the British tried to uh, uh, sentence three INA officers, the whole country rose in rebellion. And uh, so it was just a matter of a you know, couple of months. And nothing would have been better if he and Gandhiji had been present during the climactic days of the British Raj in India. Because all of the religious communities, all of the regional peoples of India had complete faith in these two men of destiny. But as, as I said, that was not, not to be. Thank you, Professor Burrs. Um, he's been so intimately connected with Mahashi's uh, uh, narrative in the family as well as a historian. How do you, as a historian and as a person, reconcile the two parallel aspects of the relationship of these two great people, non-violence and yet an understanding of Ghost G's approach to Swaraj. How do you see the two 
in context to where we are now. Uh, I just might add in response to the earlier question that on 15th August 1945, uh, Netaji issued a final order of the day where he said, never for a moment falter in your faith in India's destiny. India shall be free and before long. This was just two years before independence. Now, uh, first of all, I should say that uh, I have written about Subhash Chandra Bose as a historian. And I was very diffident about writing uh, the book, His Majesty's Opponent, for a very long time. Um, but then I felt that I had done a lot of work with my father, editing the collected works of Netaji. Uh, and also, I had the good fortune of meeting all the men and women who worked closely with, ne uh, with Netaji, who would be guests in our home as I was growing up. So I've actually heard about the submarine journey from Abid Hassan, or of the uh, uh, writing of the proclamation of the uh, uh, government of uh, Azad Hind from uh, S.A. Ayer, or the story of the Rani of Chasi Regiment from uh, uh, Lakshmi Saigal and Janaki Thevar, Athina Hapan, and so on. And so I felt that I you know, might as well sort of write this book. And I did it at a time after I had written a major work on Indian Ocean history, A Hundred Horizons. And I had been increasingly uh, be uh, becoming interested in global history. And I felt that here was a life, Shubhash Chandra Bose's life, which was a prism through which one could illuminate all of the major contradictory forces in global history during the first half of the 20th century. So that is the spirit in which I, uh, I, I wrote the book. And I throughout tried to keep uh, sort of a historian's uh, uh, distance uh, from my subject to some degree. But in a biography, you also must have some you know, empathy, try to get into the mind of your uh, or get into the mind of your subject. Now, um, Ashtandra Bose was quite clear in his own mind that any subject population uh, needs to choose the method of struggle or resistance based on the circumstances of its servitude. And he had no doubt in his mind, and he wrote as much in several essays on Mahatma Gandhi, that at the end of the First World War, constitutionalism was laid. And uh, you know, erratic individual terrorism was not getting the cause of Indian freedom anywhere. So Mahatma Gandhi came forward with a novel method of struggle, which was exactly the right one, and he roused the masses. He had uh, he had no doubts about it, and so he was very much a part of the Mahatma Gandhi-led movement for two decades. But he had also recognized that perhaps the final blow against uh, the, uh, the, the British uh, Empire uh, may have to be dealt uh, through an armed struggle. And he was especially concerned that the British had successfully kept Indian soldiers insulated from the swirling currents of Indian you know, discontent. So that's why he felt that he needed to take advantage of an international war crisis. But then, to that extent, Mahatma Gandhi also took advantage of an international war crisis when he launched the Quit India movement. And even though he would have preferred for the movement to remain non-violent, there were episodes of violence during you know, that, that movement as well. So in the cause of justice, in the cause of righteousness, uh, resort to arms, uh, um, uh, they felt may have been necessary. But I think when you talk about today's, you know, India, these are great men. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. I might also mention, you know, Rabindranath Tagore, who had uh, taught us how to love our country, how to uh, feel empathy for our fellow human beings. And I think that's the lesson that we need to learn today. Because so many people in India have forgotten how to love our own country. 
we are becoming unthinking worshippers of state power. And so, uh, so that is one. And the other is, you know, the way that both Mahatma Gandhi and Shubhash Chandra Bose were prepared to respect cultural difference, including religious difference, and by according that respect, was able to rise above that difference in order to forge an overarching unity. Neither believed in secular uniformity. And in this, I think both were different from Jawaharlal Nehru. Um, now, there is also a, a further difference between Gandhiji. You know, Gandhiji would not dine with Shaukat Ali and Muhammad Ali in the early 1920s. He, very, in a very witty way, he said that, uh, you know, eating is like the other sanitary practices of life. Uh, and so, you know, uh, the Ali brothers respect my bigotry if my self-denial may be so named. You know, he, he was brilliant at phrasing uh, his, uh, his thoughts. Uh, but he changed with the times. And obviously, uh, you know, he really thought Netaji had achieved something wonderful in breaking down the barriers in the British Indian Army. The Hindu Muslim Sikh soldiers would sit down and dine together before they went to fight together and shed their blood for you know, India's, uh, in India's freedom. And uh, Shuhash Chandra Bose used a very interesting phrase from 1928. He wanted to see cultural intimacy between India's different communities. He kept saying that we are too exclusive. I want to promote cultural intimacy. And I think, you know, that is what we must aspire for. Uh, there are many good intentioned people who are saying that we should be uh, tolerant. You know, we talk about Shahishnuta and so on. But surely we need to aspire to something higher. And there I would put forth, you know, uh, Shubhash Chandra Bose's conception of cultural intimacy, which he wrote about from the 1920s, but which he practiced when he led the, the Azad in Forge. And finally, in the context of today, and where I think Gandhi and Bose would have agreed with Rabindranath Tagore, in a, an essay called titled Bharat Varsha, Tagore had said, uh, he wrote in Bengali, but I'm translating, where there is genuine difference it is only by respecting that difference and then restraining it in its proper face, uh, proper place that you can achieve unity. You cannot achieve unity by issuing legal fiats that everybody is one. So I think the path that these great leaders, Gandhiji, Netaji, show of how to achieve unity by respecting differences, by, by crafting a sense of cultural intimacy, that is what we should be aspiring for today. Thank you. referred to the Japanese as the British of the East. Uh, and also, when Japan invaded uh, China in 1937, uh, he uh, wrote an article where uh, he expressed his entire sympathy with China and uh, said that India must draw lessons from this country and that we must aspire for national self-fulfillment in every way but not pursuing the path of self-aggrandizement and, uh, and imperialism. Uh, 
uh, and of course he was also very sharply critical uh, of, uh, of Germany and Italy as well, particularly when he was there in the middle of the, of, of the, of the 19, uh, 1930s. But then I, uh, uh, he, he decided once the war broke out that, uh, uh, and, and this becomes clear in the speeches that he delivered in uh, Bengali and Hindustani over the Azad Hind radio, that we must take advantage of this conflict between the old imperialism represented by the British and the new imperialism of which an exemplar is Japan to further the cause of our independence. So he felt that, he knew that Japan was an imperialist aggressor, certainly in Korea and in China, uh, and in relation to the Chinese people in Southeast Asia. But he also knew that in South and Southeast Asia, what Asians were fighting against uh, were various forms of British imperialism, French imperialism, Dutch imperialism, American imperialism. So in some ways, uh, he was a, a, a realist who felt that he had to take advantage of this conflict between the old and new imperialisms uh, in order to further the cause of, uh, of Asian uh, independence. Dr. Bush, you just said that uh, Netaji had said the final blow to the British uh, Empire will come from the arms program. So, do you think that viewpoint of Netaji has been vindicated by what Prime Minister of those days, which my auntie had said later to some journalists that it was not the uh, freedom struggle, non-cooperation like that, but the level of mutiny, Azadi force approaching the, the innumerable, innumerable strikes in the India, that actually made the British to uh, go away. But do, do you think that has been dedicated finally? Let me put it this way, that we have to learn how to place one statement by the British Prime Minister Clement Attlee in context. You know, he did say that, and Colin Bushan Chakraborty had reported that and so forth. But I think that um, we have to recognize that Mahatma Gandhi made the greatest contribution to the cause of India's freedom by rousing the Indian masses. He is the one who transformed the Indian National Congress from being a club of a few elite people in the cities into a countrywide mass-based political organization. So that was the foundation of our freedom struggle. But yes, it is true that Shubhash Chandra Bose was vindicated um, in the sense that he was able to destroy the loyalty of Indian soldiers to the King Emperor and replace it with a new loyalty to the cause of India's freedom. And he, his military defeat in Imphal and Kohima was transformed into political victory at the time of the Red Fort trials and their aftermath. At that point, the British recognized that they could not hold India down anymore using Indian soldiers. In fact, they realized something even bigger that they could not really use Indian soldiers in the British Empire worldwide. You know, after all, you know, the British Indian Army had been used as an imperial fire brigade to put down rebellions against the British Empire throughout the world. But that would not be possible anymore. But I would guard against claims that are made today. Um, you know, pitting one against the other. That is exactly, you know, what we should avoid uh, in this particular context. Um, so that's the only cautionary note 
uh, that I would add, while agreeing with you that yes, Netaji was vindicated in his uh, in his view, but his final blow, if we can call it that, uh, came because it was Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian people who had prepared the ground for it uh, throughout the period from you know 1919 until the outbreak of the. Uh, of, 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 of the Second World War. And to be quite honest, in today's India, we desperately need the legacies of both Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shohash Chandra Bose. And what they shared and what they had in common far outweighs their differences during 1939. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, my name is and Context to what you said, uh, that ought not to make statues. Ought not to make statues of great men, but to follow their ideals. Uh, in context to that, I would like to ask you that: uh, Do you think that our present Indian scenario is actually doing due justice to the sacrifices made by our great freedom fighters? And where are we going wrong? No is my short answer. We are not doing justice to the great sacrifices of our uh, freedom uh, fighters. Uh, now, uh, I know uh, that there is a huge statue of unity uh, in this state that has been built. And I have uh, great respect for Sardar uh, Vallabhai Patel. But during a budget debate when I was in parliament, I actually said to the Finance Minister Arun Jaitley that I think uh, Sardar Vallabhai Patel uh, would have been happier uh, if these large sums of money had been allocated towards agriculture or rural development. Uh, so we can always have a few statues. I'm not against statues. It is a form of art. But I think uh, we we must know how to uh, adorn the grand legacy uh, left to us by a galaxy of leaders of our freedom struggle, uh, of whom uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Nidhaji Shubhashan were both possibly the shining stars. Thank you, Professor. That was really wonderful. Um, as an academic and also a person in public life can respond like that. Thank you so much. It has been really a pleasure and uh, on behalf of Sabarmati Ashram, I thank profusely Professor Bose for accepting this invitation and delivering a very beautiful and brilliant lecture as I said before. Once again, I thank him. Uh, please keep coming uh, to Gujarat and please keep talking to all of us whenever time permits. We will also find opportunities to get you more times. Thank you for all the citizens in Ahmedabad who have been present for this Sabarmati lecture. I think this is one of the most well attended lectures for that. And thank you very much for the audience and thank you very much everybody. Uh, uh, please come. Uh, Nitin Bhai is going to... No, go ahead. Please come. This... Nitin Shukla, our trustee, would like to repeat his instrumental in making his 16th to 18th Professor Bose's visit to the city. So he has the privilege to announce several programs I hand over. Thank you, Mr. Darshan uh, Many of you may be aware that we do more lectures by Professor Sugata Bose. Uh, tomorrow, that is on Tuesday, uh, we are uh, at Gujarat. Uh, 
on Saturday, Saturday that is tomorrow, uh, we have a lecture at Gujarat Mishra Kosh near Ruspanpura and the subject is uh, Tagore's Cultural Cosmopolitanism. This will start at 5.30, 5.30 to 7 o'clock, including the interaction. And day after tomorrow, that is on Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning, it will be at Ahmedabad Management Association. It will be rediscovering the freedom right of Mitaji Subhash Chandra Bose, his ideals for modern India. Probably that will expand Asra's question and what God is answer. Thank you.